Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. So you already saw the little movie uh, before. So what are you looking at here are bacteria, E. coli bacteria. They are swimming in a little drop of liquid under a microscope. And if you look in this corner, you're going to see a bacteria swimming down there and then changing direction. Not this one, the next one. Here. Up, it changed direction. And the way it's doing that is <coughs> rotating flagella. When all of the motors are spinning counterclockwise, the cell is going straight. And when one of the motor or multiple motors start to spin in the other direction, basically that helical bundle becomes unstable and the cell change direction. And so those cells, what they're doing is a random walk. They go running, tumbling, running, tumbling. And the way they go towards a, a better life is that if you're moving and uh, life is, increase is getting better, you lower the probability to change direction. And so if it's getting worse, you try a new direction. And so by doing this run and tumble, they're able to go towards uh, attractant, nutrient, and so on, or away from um, uh, uh, poisons and so on. So now if you track them under the microscope, you see many of those bacteria, you see this kind of trajectory. And what's interesting is that you can study the statistics of the behavior of the individual cell from the trajectory. And if you do that, measuring the prob this probability to change direction. So it, those cells have been suspended. They, they're grown <coughs> overnight with nutrient. And then we wash the nutrient and we suspend them in an environment that doesn't provide anything for growth. And so the behavior basically is maintained from that point for at least an hour and a half. The statistics of the individual behavior remain the same. And so then you can ask, well, what's the probability to change direction of a single cell? And what's the probability to change direction of another cell? And is there differences between those cells? And so here you see that there are tracks that have all the same length, but uh, these cells is basically explore very little ground, where like this one explore, go all over the places. Okay? So there's wide cell-to-cell -cell diversity in the same population. And by recording trajectories and detecting the individual tumble, you can calculate a a distribution of this probability to tumble, which is called the tumbling bias of the individual cell in the population. And you see that there are cells that will change direction about 10% of the time and other about 40% of the time. The blue line here is a control for cells that basically cannot change direction of time. So you see that there's a wide diversity. All right, so this brings immediately a surprising, uh, an interesting question. You have one pathway which is called the bacterial chemotaxis pathway, so a set of protein that those cells are using to navigate chemical environment. They're expressing all the same genes, same protein, and they're using the same mechanism to move around, but you see very different behavior. They're all clonal cells. They all come from the same, basically, mother cell, no? and dividing over, over time. So where do these differences come from? What, what are they useful for? So the question I'm going to try to address in the next 20 minutes is, how do the variation in protein abundances affect the behavior? So what's the origin of those differences between individuals? And then how do the variation in behavior affect performance? So is this cell better at climbing a certain gradient or this one or this one? And then if there are differences in behavior, then you can ask, well, is this diversity in the population useful? And so in biology, it's typically believed that if you are navigating a, a, a fluctuating environment or multiple signal, it could be useful to have cells that have different capabilities. You know? Like in a company, it could be useful to have people who are not exact clone but have you know, different ideas. And so we're going to see if these variations in performance are useful when you're navigating a, a diverse environment. And if yes, then is there, through evolution, a selection for that diversity? And so this is interesting because I'm talking about not the selection for the actual gene, the selection for the distribution of the gene expression. And so you can talk about, we can start to talk about the code above the code, which I, I discovered that, that wording in your, in, your, in your slides. Okay, so let's go first with the first step here. Uh, oh, before that, I need to tell you what we know. So this is a very well characterized system we love it because we, we, we know all the molecules that participate into this function, and we know the reaction between those molecules and so on because there's been 50 years of molecular biology and so on. So it's a great, molecular, uh, a great model system to work on. 
So what's interesting is that they have transmembrane receptor that can sense all sorts of different things, but all that information impinge on a kinase activity key A. And then from then on, this is transmitted to a response regulator QIP by phosphorylation, dephosphorylation by S-ferase here, and this level of QIP control the probability to change direction. So if you have high kinase activity, high QIP, high probability to change direction. Low kinase, low QIP, and you, you, you have low probability to change direction. And then key R and key B are there to, uh, uh, to implement the memory of the cell. So they enable the cell to adapt to its environment. And so if there's a classic experiment from Howard Berg, who also did the movie that you saw at the very beginning, where you can measure the probability to change direction as a function of time. And when you put a step of attractant on that cell, so suddenly the world is better for that cell. So it's saying, oh, I'm going in the right direction. So it starts to swim more. So this probability to change direction goes down. And you see that then after a little while, it adapts back to this basal level or resting level. So we're going to call that the tumble bias, which is what I was measuring at the beginning. So after a little while, the cell come back to these previous statistics. And there's another very important parameter is the, the duration of that memory, this adaptation time. How long does it remember that it has seen this step before it goes back to its previous statistics? So now the question is how those, do, those two parameters are really going to be the dynamical parameter that matter when you talk about the function of climbing up a gradient. So you want to know, well, how should I choose them and what do they depend on? No? So the stumble bias and adaptation time will depend on the level of expression of those different proteins. And another thing that you see that's very interesting here is that all of those signals could have different statistics, but once the information is here, the interpretation of those signals in order to navigate is all done by four proteins, key R, key B, key Y, key Z. So how would you choose those level of those four proteins in order to navigate all these different environments? Okay, so one of the things that we developed as part of uh, the, this, 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 this grant is a way, what's very important is that you, be, you need to be relating the performance, the behavior basically, to the molecular mechanism measured inside individual cells. So you want to map at the single cell level these two things. So here we develop a system to track the cell, then we stop them, and then we can measure fluorescence inside each individual cell that we tracked. And here we fuse basically key R and key B, these two uh, memory a type of enzyme, the, the enzyme that, that mediates the, the memory, to different fluorophore. And so by doing that, we map basically the behavior, this phenotype, to the, to the protein level. And so when you do that for, for many, many different cells, we can express those levels of key R and key B over a wide range, so we try to cover as much of a range as possible. And you measure the thermal bias, this is what you discover. There's a lot of diversity that's not captured just by measuring KRKB, which means there's other parameters that also vary from cell to cell. But on average, if you do beans that are a bit larger, you see that this, in this direction, you would control the tumble bias. So it's the ratio between KR and KB that matters. If you are here, basically you tumble not very much, and if you are here, you tumble a lot. Another thing that we want to measure is the adaptation time, and Tom Shimitsu, uh, who has his lab in Amsterdam, who is a collaborator in this, uh, in, in this project, has been developing a novel way to measure uh, intracellular dynamic at the single cell level by basically having a, a fret pair between key Y and key Z, which basically give him a direct real-time report of the activity of this key YP. And he can do that at the single cell level. And so here you see individual cells uh, this, this level of QIP activity, and then you put a step that the, the, it goes down like, a, like exactly like for the tumble bias, and then there's an adaptation. And you see there's going to be a diversity in this memory duration from cell to cell. So by combining these two things of tracking the cell, stopping them, and measuring with, with, with microscopy, either with FRET or with standard uh, fluorescent microscopy, we can basically connect these two key parameters to the trajectory of the cells. So now let's talk about performance. So how do we go from here to there? So to do that, we devise another set of microfluidic devices. We do a horse race with the cells. So basically, we set a gradient, lower a gate, and load the cells behind without disturbing at all the gradient. And then we lift the gate and let them go. Okay? And we see who's going to win. And so when you do that, 
so we take movies, one after the other, along this channel and come back, so again and again and again. In each movie, we are able to then detect the individual tumble, so we have the measurement of the tumble bias of the individual cell. But we also have, if you stitch each movie along the X position and here is time, and in color I have the density of cells, you see that at the beginning the cells start right behind the gate and slowly they invade this, this, this chamber. If I smooth it out, you see the invasion of the chamber when there's no gradient. But now you can ask an interesting question. You can say, well, who is in the front, who is in the back? Or what's the performance of the cell conditional on its phenotype? And so we can do that by binning the, 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 the trajectory by the tumble bias. And so if there's no gradient, you see that if you have a high tumble bias, you're really not doing very well at invading this chamber. But if you have a low tumble bias, you're doing much better. And actually, you're doing almost as well as if you never tumble. This is a mutant that never tumbles. Now, if you put a gradient, you see that there's a wide diversity in performance of the individual phenotype in a clonal population. They all have the same genes, okay? And you see that there's wide diversity. These guys here are doing way, way worse than the guys that have the lowest tumble bias. And here is the distribution from which those data has been taken. So what I'm showing you here is that in a fixed gradient, performance depends on the tumble bias, on the phenotype. So now you can ask, well, if you're the best there, will you be the best in all environments? So what happens if I change the gradient now? So maybe the cells that are good here are not so good here and vice versa. So to do that, to address that question, what we use, again, is our inducible system to, to create two distributions of tumble bias that are very different. So the black one here is what you would see in a wild type, uh, wild type population of cells. The blue one is what we obtain by expressing this, uh, this KR at a certain level so that we get exactly the same as the, the wild type population. And the red one has a much lower tumble bias on average. So now we're going to compare the performance of the red population to the blue one. In a setup that's slightly different, here we have basically big chambers and a constant gradient, and there's cells everywhere, and we're measuring the average flux or the drift velocity of cells across in, along this gradient here that's stable, okay? And what we expect to see is that for different steepness of the gradient, so if we put more and more and more attractant here, we can make different steepness. We can measure the performance, which would be like how fast the cell is able to go from here to here. And there should be a relationship. So if we look at wild type and our blue distribution, since they have the same tumble bias, and you see that the, basically the slope is the same for those two populations. But if we look at the red one, the slope is quite different. So again, you see that which phenotype performs best really depends on the environment. Actually, you see that if the gradient is steep, you want to have higher tumble bias, so the blue one are better. But like if the green one is shallower, you wanna, the red one seems to be a bit doing better than the blue one. And so you want to have lower tumble bias when the green is shallow. And that makes sense because if the signal is shallow, you have to move and integrate over a longer time to detect something. If the signal is like this, as soon as you move, you almost saturate. So you want to have a shorter memory if you're climbing a very steep gradient. All right, so. Now, what's the mechanistic origin? So let's do a little, there's no equation, but we did a lot of math on this to try to understand where the origin of these differences in performance come from. And so one thing that's very important is that you can think about the system as the sensor that has this memory, so there's a negative feedback, then pass the information to this response regulator that then pass it to, to the motor. And the relationship between QYP and the probability to change direction is provided by this classic experiment that measured in single cell the relationship between QYP and CV bias, or tumble bias, if you want. And you see this very sharp. So if you're on the right, if the QYP level is high, the cell is tumbling all the time. If the QYP level is low, the cell is never tumbling. So that means that if you were to put a plot, do a plot of this QYP level as fun and, and plot the drift velocity, how fast those cells are able to climb in the right direction, if QYP is very low, Basically, your drift velocity is zero because you never change direction, so you cannot go in the right direction. You're just basically you know, exploring randomly. If QYP is very high, you tumble all the time, so you're not moving at all, so you're also zero. In between the two, there's going to be some sort of peak. So now, where do you want to be? If you want to be maximally performant for this particular gradient, you would want to be here. 
The problem is that it's not easy to be there because the level of QIP depend of how well you're doing as you're climbing the gradient. Because if you are very good at climbing the gradient, basically you are uh, experiencing a signal that's increasing very fast on you. So basically this negative feedback here, the, the, the sensor is being pushed down and you're moving faster and, and you receive more signal. You're moving fast and you receive more signal. So basically QIP is not at its resting level, it's at a lower level, okay? And so there's a feedback of the performance on the dynamical regime of the signaling pathway. And so this, oops. So this means that if this is your resting QIP when you're not moving, when you're actually moving, basically it's lower and you're here. So now there's this negative feedback, here's this red curve, and the intersection between the blue curve and the red curve tells you what's gonna be your drift velocity. So if you wanna be here while you're climbing the gradient, this must be your phenotype. The problem is that this slope here depends on the environment. If you're in a steeper environment, that slope is more like this. So now to be at the top here, you need to have a higher resting QIP in order, be, in order to be the best performance. So that means that it's not possible for a single cell to be good at everything, and therefore the cells face trade-offs. So now trade-offs means that it's important because as I was showing you, the, the architecture of this system is that you have multiple type of receptor and that can sense all sorts of signal, but at the end you have one pathway that interprets all those signals. And this is very common in biology. And so this horizontal integration architecture leads to conflicting demand on the signaling pathway that need to interpret those signals that could have very different statistics. You can always make a receptor that can sense things new. But if this new signal has a very different statistics, then you have a problem when you need to interpret it. And so one question is that maybe cell-to-cell -cell or non-genetic phenotypic heterogeneity might help resolve those trade-offs. And so theoretically, we can look at that question. You say, well, where would you want to be in this parameter space of adaptation time and tumble bias? If you need to climb a very steep gradient, you want to have short memory and tumble a bit more than if you need to be in a shallow gradient, which will be the blue region, and this is for an intermediate. Now the dark region here is showing where you would want to be if you need to be at the 99th percentile of your maximum speed. Therefore, if you want to be basically at the near top here. So if selection for your function is very strong, then you need to be very performant in all of those environments, then you're gonna need some sort of diversity because you cannot be in all places together. But if selection is not that strong, if it's not that important to be so uh, performant, if you can live with 40% uh, performance, then you see that you can start to have a generalist type of solution to the problem. So understanding the role of diversity is gonna require understanding not only this trade-off in performance, but also the strengths of the selection on the function. If the selection is mild, individual can survive with weak performance and a generalist solution works. If performance is important, you have strong selection. For example, you need to escape the immune system, so if you don't swim fast enough, you're dead, okay? Basically, that's what it is. So then you would want diversification. So these ideas are further explored in, 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 in these papers. I don't really have the time to go on, so I had like something about the code above the code, but we can discuss it. The question is, these cells, so now you would think, depending on the environment, you need to, selection could maybe shape this distribution to a generalist solution or to a specialized solution, depending on the trade-off that you face. And we looked at that theoretically, and we showed that it's actually possible, theoretically, that um, the system is able to, so the, the chemotaxi system, by only looking at um, basically selection on regulatory element. So selection on the regulatory element that control the level of expression of the protein, theoretically in this case, is enough to distribute the cells uh, in the right place in terms of mathematics, in terms of resolving the, the trade-off. So if you have a shallow, uh, a, a weak trade-off, basically you can, the, through selection of the RBS strength or the 
the promoter region of the gene and so on, you can go towards a generalist solution to the problem. If instead you need more diversity to have more specialists, then you can go towards uh, uh, a more specialized uh, solution without any modification of the gene, only mutation on the regulatory element. Therefore, this is what I would call this uh, code above the code. What is that control the distribution of protein abundances for every pathway in biology, basically? Okay, so I'll finish here. Um, in summary, I showed you that when you're moving, sensing when you're moving is not the same as sensing when you're immobilized. And a lot of experiments are those response in the lab. When you're swimming a, a per gradient, the signal that you're seeing depends on your response and how good you are at climbing this gradient. So that makes the problem more difficult. Then the second thing is that environmental diversity and horizontal integration create conflicting demands on this core signaling pathway because you have multiple signal, but at the end they have to be interpreted by only a few molecules. And then non-genetic diversity could provide some sort of collective fitness advantage if it's tuned in the right way. And mechanisms to do that are mutation of regulator element, not into the gene. All right, so we were, this work was done by this different postdoc, and we had a collaboration between Steve Zucker for the math and Tom Shimizu, uh, who is here. I don't know if Steve made it, but he should be around here. So thank you. Yes? I, I'm always interested in looking for the drivers for set points in a circuit like this. Um, Terry Gasterlein from the TFC, by the way. And it looks like the ratio of Y and Z are going to be a driver for picking the set point for a particular cell. And since a particular cell keeps its set point, you know, it either tumbles a lot or tumbles a little, over time, then there must be some sort of feedback loop that's buffering the ratio of Y to Z. Have you looked at that? That's buffering the ratio of oh, y to y z in terms of z. gene expression? Right, because the amount of yeah. y p is driving what your angle is, and the amount of z is driving y p returning back to y. So in this system, there's many different uh, <coughs> architecture at, it, at the genetic level of the regulatory system that controls the expression of those genes. That has been shown already. So in terms of the means of those distributions, for example, Q, QR, QB are next to each other on one of their own, and QI, QZ are right after them. So they're all co-transcribed, which means that that reduces the level of intrinsic noise between those genes. And then, so then there's a feedback of, of phosphorylation of QB on, on, in order to be active that also kind of tend to keep those, those, those mean together. So all of this is already included here. What I'm doing here is just that I'm saying, okay, I'm going to keep all the reaction like we know. The only thing I'm able to change is the level of expression of the, the mean intrinsic noise and extrinsic noise. Those are the only parameters that are able to change. All the rest, simulation of the cells, upper gradient, and so on, is the same for all. And you see that if you look at an environment where you need to climb, to stay close to a source, or you need to forage around, uh, you're able to basically spread because you're not able to be good at both. So in this case, you need to basically try to, to, to spread along these two axes. And this is what you can do in this case by just increasing the, the, this noise. Yes? Terrific lecture. We're undergoing a revolution <coughs> right now in our understanding of the structure of cells and how molecular complexes like the bacterial rotary motor, the receptors that sense on the cell surface are connected. Mm -hmm. All cells are highly organized in their cytoplasm or from mm -hmm. the protoplasm. Even the lowly bacteria that can do yeah. that pejoratively, we now believe are not stochastic bag, you know, stochastically motivated bags. Yeah. You've shown some very interesting data on multiple pathways that activate or where information is held differently based on input. Mm -hmm. Do you think that some of these newer findings about the organization provide potentially a scaffold for that signal? Yes, yeah, so. Threat signaling? What is the, the memory machine, 
in structure between the surface and the motor. So the structure in, in this signaling pathway, so this signaling pathway, what's great about it is extremely well studied. So we know also the spatial organization of all of this protein inside the cell, and this is taken into account to a large extent in all of those simulations I was showing you, for example. So you see here, you have data on the, the, the receptor are clustered, and so because they are clustered, one, when one receptor responds, multiple receptor can, that one receptor bind a signal, multiple receptor can respond, and that amplifies the signal. And this has been measured in, in cells by, you know, and so here you see a model and the data. Uh, the same here at the back, uh, the motor is composed of multiple subunits that cooperatively switch direction, and that's where you can get such a very sharp decision making. Here you look at actually the stochastic, uh, adapt, adapt, the stochastic process of adaptation in single cell, and we can measure that in single cell and measure the noise, in, for example, uh, in, in the response of the system, and related to its adaptation time. And so the, this is the model I was using to do this prediction at the end. But the model is extremely well con uh, constrained by the data. So it's a great system to, to look at, at, at that question. Yeah, I guess what I'm saying is the molecules that are signaling to one another may be more ear to ear. And you may see signaling along surfaces and some residue, if you like, of the signal on those surfaces because things are not as randomly moving. You already alluded uh -huh. to that, but I think that what we're seeing with high resolution imaging so, and the location of these kinds of signaling molecules says. So actually, there's a surprise. It used to be that, so we know the structure of the arrangement of the, the, the receptor and the motor inside the membrane of those cells for a long time. And so everybody was doing models that are actually pretty static in terms of the structure. But we just discovered that actually they're much, much more dynamic than what we thought. And for example, a lot of the subunits of this motor, which look like really like a, a machine almost designed by the human, there's all this thing about intelligent design about those no, things. Well, Life. Yes. So even in those motors that are so tightly uh, built, there's very strong evidence now that actually the subunit move in and out of the motor and everything is much, much more dynamic than, than previously believed. So this is, an, I think, it's a new direction in this kind of context. I'm sorry, we have to call this to a close. Um, please feel free to, to find Terry over break and lunch. It's a great discussion to have. And we'll be moving on. But thank you, Terry, for that great talk.